Greetings Guardians, my name is Bife here. A few weeks back I started covering what happened to Sloane during her mission on Titan. In the latest episode of that series, which oddly enough did start at the very end, I covered how Sloane was there to see the abduction of Titan firsthand. During these moments, Sloane seemed to also witness strange time distortions and saw visions of the past and the future, as well as seemingly another world. She then seemed to be led to safety by something in the form of a serpent, presumably Asa. In today's episode, we'll be exploring more of Sloane's story on Titan and piecing together what happened to her in the times between the abduction and Titan's return in the Season of the Deep. This will also lead to the incident deep in Titan's methane oceans that led to Sloane being infected with Taken energy. Really quickly though, shout out to Apex Gaming PCs, the sponsor of this video. You can use my discount code, aka code BIFE, at checkout to save up to 5% on any of their products, including my own nerdy line of custom PCs. They're titled Captain, Baron, and Kel because, yeah, I named them after Ranks of Fallen, and I'm a massive nerd. Get a great gaming PC out of the box with no hassle over at Apex. Thanks again to them for sponsoring this video. Our story picks up again in the third day of Titan's abduction. At this moment, Sloane discovers something strange that unsettles her, and also potentially provides us with some terrifying answers. Repulsion Lattice Integrity, Nominal. Oxygen Sieve, Nominal. Depth, 106 meters. The lettering on Sloane's heart clarified into vision. She dragged a hand through methane fluid to her faceplate, absentmindedly trying to rub the grogginess from her eyes. Motion in the dark surrounding her kicked up clouds of fine grit. Her headlights flared as her fingertips clinked against her helmet. A thrall came screaming into the beam of light, bubbles spewing from its jaw. Sloane's eyes went wide before she reflexively flipped the thrall over her shoulder and kicked its jaw through its skull. Her power suit spooled and pushed stimulants reactively. She pivoted and caught the sword of a knight mid-swing, snapping the weapon in two between the fingers of her gauntlet and driving a shard of broken blade into its chest. Another thrall crossed her headlights just before a silver streak whistled through its throat. Sloane eyed a selection in her visor, which highlighted over 30 dead hive, slowly deteriorating in boils of tiny, rumbling ignitions that sent nerve spasms through their husks. Her visor cleared the reading and snapped onto a friendly. Johan drifted forward, hive viscera gently wafting into the sea from the slender razors protruding from her shell. You were out for days. Sloane's face wrinkled in confusion. I remember the pyramid wave. Falling. Dreams. Are you okay? I found us, like you said, Johan said, retracting her blades. Sloane grabbed the ghost and hugged her to her power suit chassis for a moment. Little killer really gave him the business. Johan chirped. Pyramid wave swept over Titan, bounced around a bit and centralized where the pyramid stopped. Gravity went crazy, then the ocean. I think we're a few miles from where we were when all this started. The pyramid stopped? Then that's where we're headed, after we grab some gear, Sloane said. Johan dipped forward. One more thing. Something out there is circling us. Not Hive. Can't quite pin it down, but it's big. Yeah? Sloane said, thinking of what went through her mind before she lost consciousness. Then let's not waste any time getting out of here. Sloane lifted herself from the ocean onto a half-submerged arcology platform where she'd stowed a variety of rations and munitions since Titan's skies went dark. Her power suit clattered against the steel mesh floor. She waited for the echoes to die down before taking a moment to exhale in silence. In that quiet moment, she made out a faint voice. Johan rose into view. Do you hear that? I was about to ask you, Sloane said, standing. 
She snatched a shotgun, first in, last out, from a stow locker, racked the foregrip, then followed the voice down a barnacle-crusted causeway to an old research lab with Shiohan in tow. Fluid trickled down cracked walls surrounding rows of dead monitors. Glass reflected prismatic color from a gnarled tear in reality at the lab's center, as if it had been carved from another epoch and affixed to this one. A human that didn't seem to notice them paced within the tear, standing in a fully functional mirage of the arcology. Once he turned toward them, the tear spasmed and lurched forward and backward in time at erratic durations and speed. He was ripped both ways into non-existence as the tear flittered through events like a fourth-dimensional montage. The tear held steady again, returning the man and his moment to existence. Johan took note of the badge on his coat that read Gideon Teppin, NPA, Senior Marine Biologist. Teppin looked upset and turned away before speaking. She's afraid. That's why we're all having them. Something's wrong. She's showing us what's coming in plain view. The man angrily swiped his hand through the air in Sloane's direction. It's like she's screaming it into my head. I know I'm not the only one hearing it. It chose us. He stepped forward and placed his hand on the border between then and now. I'm dreaming my own memories, but with little differences, little omens, black ships in the sky. Sloane leaned forward, hand nearly pressed to that of the living memory playing out before her on the other side of the tear. She's trying to warn us. We should evacuate. We have to get her- The tear lurched again, ripped away, lost to the rushing passage of time and blinked into non-existence. Gone. Sloane dropped her hand, jaw clenched. See if you can dig up any arcology records on this. That marine biologist, Teppen, was he in some sort of captured time fluctuation? Is that even possible? Sloane asked. I've never seen anything like it, Shihan said. I'm not really sure. Shihan skimmed archived reports. It's under T Lev 01. Looks like a psychic space whale some biologists were studying out in the ocean. They never got accurate measurements, but this estimate can't be correct. Over 150 meters? Report says it wasn't from here, though, and refers to a lot of visions that personnel were having, which is odd. Not a lot of alien species in Sol until after the Golden Age. I was having dreams while I was out of some other world, the pyramid on Titan, uh, the, the tower, like I remembered being there for each one. Well, I guess it could be an ancient space whale, or sometimes the traveler gives people dreams, but are we going to ignore the obvious you were rendered unconscious by a pyramid wave explanation? No, but we've seen enough weird not to knock it. Sloane sighed. Sure, I'll log that anyway, Shuhan said. You know, the readings coming from inside that field Teppen was in were consistent with atmospheric records on Titan during the collapse. What does that mean? Sloane looked back to the spot of warped space-time. Was he real? I don't know. I just know it wasn't a simulation. These strange wounds in time give Sloane an unprecedented view at a moment which will be crucial to her story, a moment that gives context as to what Arsa is, and to the fact that she has been here ever since the Golden Age, a traveler from another world, one who has arrived on Titan as a refugee with a warning of doom. This is also something which leads us to a split notion as to how these rifts in time formed. They seem to be very specific in their moments, which tells us that there may well have been a reason as for them to being around. I have two theories as to what's going on. The fact that they seemed to directly address Sloane almost, putting their hand up to the space in the rift where it was being formed, seems to imply that this was deliberately meant to convey this information to Sloane, not that this information was being dug up in the first place. 
if that conjecture is true, my first theory that these time rifts somehow have been created by Asa to provide us with context. That's not entirely clear, and there is unfortunately an even more terrifying possibility. I believe that these time rifts may have been an effect of the pyramid ship's abduction of Titan, but also may be indicative of something far greater. When Mars was returned to us during the Witch Queen, we saw similar rifts in time all across its surface. It was made clear to us thanks to the long investigation board quest that the Witness was using these time rifts to search for more information on Nathele Stronghold, Neomuna, and the location of the Veil. The time rifts are like scars upon space-time, indicating that the Witness has been searching. It's entirely possible then that these wounds in time were not created by Arsa, but were a means of finding her. Something created by the Witness, with the objective of discovering Arsa's location thanks to something that the scientists of the Golden Age Arcology had blurted out. Nothing apparently happened, seeing as Arsa is still here, but if that is what left behind those tears in time, it does seem clear suddenly why it's going after Arsa specifically. This is no confirmation either way, but I think it's worth remembering that these are things that we could either see via indications of intention or what's previously happened in game. Regardless of the truth, it's now pretty clear. Arsa is someone that has been studied for a long time and will perhaps be the source of many further questions to come. It's also worth remembering that in the next entry, we see that the pyramid ship that Sloane eventually gives chase to has been stopping and starting continuously as if moving around to find something of its own. It may well be the case that Titan's abduction was made specifically because Arsa is on Titan, and for no other reason. Needless to say, killing or capturing her would be a major objective of the Witness, as her information was crucial for us to understand the Witness itself, its machinations, and its plots. Sloane, however, is none the wiser to all of this, and merely picks up on the information that was scrounged, there is a Leviathan-class creature within the depths of Titan that was psychically communicating with Golden Age scientists, including one senior marine biologist, Gideon Teppin, of the New Pacific Arcology. This Leviathan-class creature measured in excess of 150 meters, although measurements were inaccurate. And most importantly of all, two things that Sloane's ghost pointed out. There was a creature stalking them out in the ocean, circling them, and, more importantly than that still, what Sloane saw in the time distortion was not a simulation, it was real. Under most normal circumstances, I would think that the first of these nuggets of information would have been the more important one to deal with, but given the imminent doom presented by the pyramid fleets and the arrival of a second collapse, this would immediately have been bumped into a secondary concern. As it stood, it was just another horrifying detail of their situation. A giant serpent could swallow them in the middle of the ocean out of nowhere, and they'd be no better off than they were before. As it stood, they simply needed to put one foot in front of the other and keep going. Incredible human resolve as that might take. Following on from this, Sloane continues to hunt for more information on the location of the pyramid on Titan, and discovered a series of hive ritual sites across the ocean floor. Upon reaching each site though, it was clear that there was a hive ritual that had been conducted that had already ended, and nobody was there except, on occasion, a few fallen who clearly had been turned into Wrathborn. This was something which meant Sloane was continuously on the back foot, chasing ghosts, chasing the Pyramid Fleet, and chasing whatever hive of forces had come with it. Day 92. Take and live. Sloane deftly maneuvered across the open ocean floor, Together with her ghost, she'd chased the pyramid's signals across Titan, but arrived too late at each coordinate site. They'd encountered nothing more than further wounds in the fabric of reality, slivered glimpses into moments held in Titan's memory. Occasionally, discarded shrieker cores littered a site, evidence of a ritual gone cold. But not so cold that Shiohan couldn't detect figments of resonant residue that drove her scanners haywire. More than once, Sloane had found a clutch of disoriented fallen scattered around these wounds, some in a stupor, most driven violently mad. 
Johan said their brain patterns were fractured, synapses burnt into conflicting circuited loops, as if their collection of experiences had been dissected and left disparate and apart. But Sloan felt drawn across the barren seafloor to each new sight shrouded in sunless shadow. Something cut through that dark, guided her, as if she drifted behind a rogue wave. We're almost to the next site, Johan said. Let's pick it up. The methane flowed over Sloane's armor in a slick slipstream current that left a long tail of particulate floating in her wake, agitated by oxygen bubbles spurting from her mask. Johan followed close behind, sweeping the area with light beams that dissipated over vast featureless depths. Resonant pyramid energy, neutrino dispersals, and some kind of quantum entangling. That's the best I can make of it, Johan said. Razor blades deployed. The pyramid's moving again. The sight seemed quiet on the surface. Sloan glanced over a sea cliff and tapped Shohan, who had been leering out at the expanse of dark ocean as if she was tracking something. You ready? The ghost turned to Sloan and hesitantly tilted her shell into a nod. They killed their lights, allowing the bioluminescent coral around them to illuminate the path down to a newly split open gorge infested with taken corruption. Sloane swapped her visor to a thermal targeting overlay and slipped over the edge of the chasm. Tendrils of taken malignance flowed from the split ground beneath her, dancing in the methane like noxious filaments. The fissure looked large enough for her to finagle her suit through safely. Sloane glanced over her shoulder and held up a hand to Shahan. Watch my back from a distance. Uh, no. I can fight, she bit back defiantly. Fallen Hive and Taken are all over this sector. Lie low on this one. If something goes wrong, I can't go wrong with you. Got me? She landed in a small cavern where a tangle of Taken threads writhed around a decrepit hive sigil of resilient witchcraft. Whispers spewed from the sigil, wrapped around her mind, coaxed her forward. She reached a hand toward the sigil, and methane burst around her like depth charges as taken blights manifested a small detachment of soldiers. Sloane spun, her fist crackling with lightning, her fingers weaving her arc light safely through the methane around her. She charged the fist of three blights, thrust a dodging incoming fire pinged by her HUD. She broke through the blight screen, planted her feet and threw a lightning punch like a gorse cannon, atomizing the Taken and the Blight itself. Her power suit carried her fulgurate fists from hostile to hostile in rising, truculent battle fervor. When the cavern quieted, Sloane turned back to the sigil and called Shiohan down. I can hear the Taken through this sigil thing. It's like they're broadcasting out loud. Not in words, but... Their proximity. Like sonar. Can you tap into it? Chiohan's concerned response was muffled by an intrusive thought echoing from somewhere far off, circling the sea around her and draining off into her mind. Take. Live. Sloane thought of the ocean shelves, crawling with the pyramid's minions, their rituals and corruptions sinking deeper into Titan's mantle by the day, of the armies they threatened to summon, of what they searched for in the deep. She thought of the fallen who had no way to flee, shocked into madness by the reality-wounding waves that swept over Titan like a grey matter line, a terminator of experience via suspension within it. With this knowledge of her enemy's plans, maybe she could be a step ahead of Dusk. Take. Live. Sloane stepped forward, dazed, her mind drowning in the ocean's dangers, and gripped the sigil. The rippling taken energy immediately backfired in a blinding burst of energy. 
No! Chihan dove forward in horror as Taken tendrils twisted around Sloane's arm and dragged her to the ground. Sloane! As tendrils buried themselves into her flesh, Sloane heard a new voice, clear as sirens in a storm. Warrior of the sky, you are known to me. I accept your challenge. This appears to be the moment at which Sloane was infested with taken corruption, a burden that she seems sure to carry for the rest of her days, unless something utterly remarkable should happen. It's worth noting that the extent of Sloane's corruption leaves a distinction between her and others who are fully taken. Under normal circumstances, as best we know, a taken is abducted from our plane by those in command of the witness's forces or the witness itself. The abductee is then hollowed out with the intent of being stripped of their agency and will, filling them instead with taken corruption, dark energy. These taken then possess no will of their own and can be deployed as mindless, perfectly obedient shock troops to battlefields where they might make a difference. Sloane appears to have made contact with that corrupting taken energy that has woven its way into her arms and legs, but it's clear that she was able to escape the complete transformation into a Taken. The specifics beyond this moment are vague, but it does seem that her incredible resilience and paracausal nature as a guardian may have been potential factors that allowed her to escape the grim fate of being a mindless servant of the Witness. Regardless, this momentary glance into the moment is all we really get, and it's not clear how Sloane immediately managed to escape the tendrils afterwards. Knowing Shia Han and her surprisingly resilient shell blades, it's possible that the ghost was able to help her. But regardless, Sloane was able to claw away from the sigil, wounded, broken with taken energy, corrupted, still alive, still with her own agency. And then there were the two voices, one clearly that of Zivu Arath, one more subtle, that of Asa. It's clear now that Sloane's quest was leading her on dark paths, and she would continue to follow the pyramids across Titan, leading her deeper into Titan's oceans and further into the clutches of her enemy, Zivu Arath. In the final episode of this series that will come soon, we'll be talking about the moment that Asa revealed herself to Sloane, saved her life, and more importantly, prevented the war god from killing the deputy commander. But that's all for now. Thank you so much for watching. If you enjoyed, go ahead and leave a like. And if you want more video content, go ahead and hit subscribe and the bell next to subscribe. Of course, if you enjoyed this video, go ahead and leave a like. And if you have your own thoughts, leave them down below in the comments section. But as per usual, know that your viewership, as always, is quite enough for me. And that in the meantime, my name has been my name is Bife. Rodasia Arastra. I'll see you, Starside.